I'm not defined by wins and losses. I'm defined by my relationship with the Lord. God gives me wins. He gives me losses. I'll learn from both of them. So it was Boom. just said. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So uh, our, our first, our inaugural episode of, I'm calling it the Hunter's Altar, because I figure that uh, most men, oftentimes most men, they're never more honest and more vulnerable than when you're sitting around a campfire. So I've often said that a campfire is a hunter's altar. You know, it's kind of like it's a time to reflect and um, uh, it's just a kind of time where everything's just shut out. When you're just kind of staring in that light and you're just kind of, you know, lost in your thoughts, so to speak. Um, so our first guest on the hunter's altar is not a hunter. <laughs> our first guest grew up four miles from where I did, on a farm much like me, a little bit older than myself. But he's a Christian, he is a husband, he is a father, he is recently inducted into the World Wrestling Hall of Fame, is that right? Yeah. And he is an Olympic gold medalist in 1976 and an Olympic silver medalist in 1972. John Peterson, I remember wrestling as a kid, and I remember seeing that sign in Comstock, Wisconsin, which is just a tiny little town that you basically live right next to. I remember seeing that sign, Home Comstock. I mean, you got a, there used to be a bar, there was a tiny auto dealership and a cheese house, and the, but there was that sign, and I, I mean, I remember, this is no joke. I'm not just trying to ruffle your, you know, fluff your feathers here, but I remember looking at that every time that I drove through and seeing that. It's like, man, an Olympic gold medalist, two of them, no less, two brothers, your brother Ben was a, also an Olympic gold medalist and a silver medalist, you guys swapped who got silver and, and gold on, on the opposing years, 72 and 76. I think, I think that's why we're in the World Wrestling Hall of Fame, because we're brothers doing it at the same time, more than our actual skills. <laughs> Like, I it's doubt that, to... but I suppose that just adds to it. That's just kind of the cream and the coffee. But I remember seeing that as a kid, and that gave me so much hope and belief. Because there's a guy that grew up the way I did, and he was the best wrestler in the world. I mean, that's so powerful. I'm, I'm sure you probably kind of recognize that, but in the same breath, you never know who that's influencing and I mean I wrestled not not super serious but um, but that just leads one to believe and dream that anything is possible so I am humbled and honored to have you here as our very first guest so John Peterson welcome well thank you thank you so I, I'm impressed that you can hunt like you do <laughs> oh well, you haven't hunted with me, so don't be too impressed because that's the magic of camera and magic of editing. So, um, so describe your childhood growing up in Comstock, Wisconsin. What was that like? Well, um, I have uh, four brothers and a sister. My mom and dad actually had a little baby girl that died when she was just three days old. That was their first child, and they they weren't expecting to have more than one or two. So I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, someday when I get to heaven, I'm gonna I'm gonna thank Priscilla, or I might not even be around. Well, that's a crazy thing. We we could go on to a whole theological discussion about that. But <laughs> growing up uh, as a young kid on a farm, I was great. My dad uh, only had about twenty twenty five cows, so he couldn't make a living off of that. But we had pigs, we had chickens, and then Dad worked at the feed mill, Comstock. We went to country school. We'd walk from home to school about a mile, ride bike a lot. Um, but growing up on a farm, you, you can't beat it. The, the, the life, well, we had an older brother who loved sports, so he, he'd uh, make a football field, he'd make a baseball field, and we'd play all those games. We had a basketball court in our barn. So nice. We, yeah, we grew up being athletes. Our dad, when we went to seventh grades in that country school and, and uh, didn't have a chance to participate in organized sports, so he did everything he could to allow us to... We had neighbor boys who couldn't be in sports because they had to do chores. Dad didn't do that with us. We helped with the chores in the morning, but hardly ever at night because we'd be 
at football practice or wrestling practice. Now it had to be pretty rare for your day and age. It I was. mean that you were allowed to do that. It it was. Yeah, we we're forever thankful to our dad. He made sacrifices so that we could do what he couldn't do. He he played sports with us. <laughs> Because there was five of us boys, so that would be an uneven team, so then he'd be on one of the teams. Perfect. Well, I'm looking back at that now, that had to mean a lot to you. I'm sure it did then, too, but I mean, that had to mean a lot. Because I, I know that was one thing that I really cherished any time I got with my dad. Because as hard as farming was to make a living, that puts a lot of pressure on the man to, you know, the father, the husband, to provide for the family. And that puts a lot of pressure because it's pretty easy to look at the short-term need of survival and providing versus the long-term outcome of, you know, expecting maybe too much out of your children to make a living for the family. So that's, yeah, that, that's a oh, that's yeah, awful. I think you're speaking to one of the one of the benefits that we had growing up on the farm, which was true for much more of America. Uh, much more rural workings, small farms, and well, even when our dad went to uh, working at the feed mill, we'd we'd come home from school, uh, walk through Comstock on our way back home. If there was a railroad car next to the feed mill, we knew oh, we got a bunch of brand bags, hundred pound bags. Dad's going to need some help getting those into the building, and so we would go in and, and do that, or we'd go in and help uh, pile the the sacks of, of feed onto the trucks that the farmers would come in with. And so we were involved in our dad's life in a lot of different ways. And of course doing chores at home. And yeah. So your parents, they made Christ followers? The, what, what was that? What was your childhood like as far as, um, you know, did they, did they always go to church? Did they always, you know, your faith, was it always integral in your childhood? Yeah, it was. Um, I don't know how much detail you want to get into this. Uh, when, you when tell they, me. Do you think it's... Just... When they lost their first little girl, that was had a huge effect on their lives. Dad grew up in a Swedish Lutheran church here in Cumberland. And um, little Priscilla wasn't able to be baptized. So 11 months later, when Phil came along, people were saying, man, you got to really get that kid baptized. It caused them to get on a search of what does it really mean to have a relationship with the Lord. My, it would have been my uncle, dad's older brother, died of um, diabetes when he was just 35. They didn't have good care for diabetes back in those days, in the 30s, 1930s. And he had a talk with my dad, you know, dad had grown up in the church, and he said to dad, you know, you can go to church all your life, you can be a good kid, <clears throat> do right things, but if you don't have a vital relationship with the Lord Jesus, and you haven't trusted what he did when he died on the cross for you, it doesn't mean a thing. Dad was 28 when he had that talk with his brother, and it changed his life. And my mom, through the, <clears throat> through the pastor there at at the Swedish Lutheran Church, trusted the Lord in a similar way and time. And so we, we grew up with that understanding. Um, I, I was probably uh, 8, 10 when uh, God was starting to work on my heart big time. I tell a story sometimes about pushing a kid playing a game at the school, country school that we went to. Prisoner's base, it was called. Just so I could get first place, I pushed this kid into the gravel there, and he scraped up his arms, and I'm just feeling so guilty. John, you're just thinking about yourself wanting to win. And so, by the time I was 12 years old, we had gone to a a lot of different evangelistic means where we'd heard this these idea that you need to trust Jesus, you need to ask Him into your heart. I had done it probably, I don't know how many times. We finally went to a Billy Graham crusade in Minneapolis, and 
Billy Graham quoted a verse in Matthew, if you're not willing to confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father in heaven. And that, that, um, that message just hit my heart, and I said, I don't care what anybody thinks, I want to go down there, and I'm going to commit my life to Christ with my dad by my side. We went down, I trusted Jesus. Now, when I was actually born again, like you talked about in one of your videos, <laughs> an experience that you had um, in the woods, in the wild, I, I don't know exactly when that happened, but I've come to know that my trusting in Jesus and His righteousness is way more important than anything that I did as far as asking Him into my heart. Some experience that I had, I'm not trusting in. I'm trusting in His righteousness, not mine. And so I had to learn that as a young boy growing up. You had to learn that as a young boy. What, what do you mean? You had to learn that. I had to learn that my righteousness, my being good enough, was never going to make it possible for me to have this everlasting relationship with the Lord Jesus. Right. Our dad used to quote the verse constantly, often. <laughs> ben and I had a wrestling camp. Dad would often share with the kids. And, and one of the verses he would always share is Titus 3, 5, and 6. Not by works of righteousness that I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved me. And so that's, that's what I had to learn. John, you can be a good person, but if you don't have this relationship with Lord Jesus because you've trusted in what He did when He died for you, rather than in yourself, it means nothing. And that, that became a wrestling match for me while I was competing. Football and wrestling became more important when I was in high school than my relationship with the Lord. And so He had to bring me through some difficult lessons to help me to see. John, I noticed I noticed you limping a little bit when you were walking in here. He didn't he didn't pull your hip out of joint, did he, like he did Jacob? That was Jacob, right? Then he wrestled? Well, I have two artificial hips, so it's not the hip. It's okay, the, <laughs> the knee. Okay. My, my freshman year of high school, our oldest brother, Phil, uh, was a great athlete, although Tom, the second one that came along, was the one that got us into wrestling. Because Phil played basketball. That's a whole other story. The basketball players, those are just pretty boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a good basketball player. At the, he was a sixth man on the, on the, as a junior. And uh, <clears throat> the football coach, they got, a new, they got a new wrestling and football coach his junior year. And that, and that coach said, Phil, you keep playing basketball, you'll get no notice down in Madison. But you go out for wrestling, you're good enough. When you're a senior, you can make it to the state tournament. And then you'll get some recognition from the University of Wisconsin football coach. Plan worked perfect. <laughs> He did it. He went to state. He got a scholarship. Played football at Wisconsin. So I'm playing football as a freshman. I only weigh 95 pounds. And they put me in uh, fullback or running back just like my brother Phil. You know, think I'm going to be this great stud. I, and I tore a cartilage in my knee uh, probably two or three weeks into practice. Th two months, no train, no, uh, no football actually walking around on crutches for two months. They, they would drain my knee about every two weeks. It was a disaster. Hmm. So I got through with that and started wrestling as a sophomore, same year Ben did. But the, by the time I was a junior, I had to have that cartilage removed. And uh, then it's swelling up during football season my junior year, or my senior year. And the doc says, uh, you know, you keep playing football and wrestling when you're 40, you won't be walking. That's why I was limping out there. Yeah. I, I, had it, I, had it, I had it operated on again in uh, my last year of competing in 1979, right after the World Championships. So the doc told me 13 years ago I needed to replace that knee, but I'm, I'm, I'm stalling on it. Stubborn. You're rest now you're wrestling with the doctor. Well, let, let me get back. I'm sorry to interrupt and kind of get, get, shift your gears. But, you, you so you were, wrestling, you were wrestling with God. You're, you're wrestling with God throughout high school and, and during your wrestling. So maybe let's let's stick with that. What did that look like? What are you wrestling with him? What, what's the wrestling match between well, you and God? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that that's, that's too strong of a word. I'm not really wrestling with God. I'm, I'm knowing that, that God has created me for his glory. Isaiah 43, 7 says that. 
He's created us for Him. And when we put anything else in front of Him, we're going to be miserable. So that's, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't enjoying the competition like I could have been if, if I had the, the, the better perspective. I knew I should be honoring God more. I was reading my Bible, I was seeking to do good things, trying to fight against wrong thoughts and wrong actions, but not always being successful. I wasn't just a you know, great little guy. When, when, when we put anything in our lives ahead of God, it's like idol worship. And so it was kind of like that for me in sports. Perfect. That'll be a good uh, segue for us. Um, did you did you have a gift? Do you, do you feel you had a gift for wrestling? Or do you think that you just had so much of something else, whether it be work ethic, drive, that, that brought you to where you got in, in wrestling? You, are you a natural at it? Or do you think you're stubborn enough or just hardworking enough or strong enough? Like, what is your strong suits that, that led you to where you are? Because obviously you had to have a lot of those things, but do you feel you were gifted? Yeah, I, I, so I would say it's a little bit of both. I, I was gifted in certain ways, but there had to be a drive. The sport of wrestling is, I think, unique at, in that... Um, you don't have to be an outstanding athlete to do well. You know, the guy who got Ben and I up to the Olympic level was Dan Gable. And uh, Dan was not as gifted athletically as a lot of the guys that were in his weight class. I, I trained with a lot of 149 pounders, which is the weight Dan wrestled in, that were quicker than he was. Uh, I don't know if any of them was stronger because he made himself strong, but he didn't have a lot of natural strength like some guys. They don't have to lift weights. They just, they're naturally strong. <laughs> um, I, I had, you know, middle child wanted to get attention. <laughs> I, I, I had this drive, inner drive, competitive drive that not everybody has. Um, but seeing seeing our mom and dad work the way they did gave us a real work ethic that we could we could push ourselves and that's one of the big things that helps in wrestling if you have the drive to work hard you know i saw watching the world championship the world cup yesterday <laughs> some guys lost matches because he got tired and the guy won only because he kept pushing this didn't have any quit in them. That, right. How about in high school? Were you a standout? Were you a state champ? Never qualified for the state tournament. Wow. Huge disappointment for me in my senior year. I lost to a guy from New Richmond in the semifinals of the sectional tournament. And I was so devastated because I was thinking all year long, oh, I, I want to be state champ. I want to be state champ. Yeah, that's my goal. And, Setting goals is dangerous if you don't have the right perspective on it. This whole idea of, of putting your goal on the, on the mirror and thinking, I want to be state champion, I want to be national champion, and seeing that every day, um, I'm, I'm not sure that's a healthy way to do it. it. It backfired for me big time. If I had been thinking of it in the right way, I would have been thinking, okay, state champion, it's a realistic goal for you. But your, your job here at the sectional tournament is to qualify for state. You don't have to even win this thing. So when I lost in the semifinals, I should have been thinking, okay, John, you get yourself ready. You're good enough. You can come back and you can get second place and you can qualify for state tournament. Well, I was so down. I lost to a guy, a guy from Unity. <laughs> I had beat them soundly during the year. But emotionally, I was way down here. Didn't come back. Guess who won the state tournament next week? The guy who I lost to from New Richmond was state champion. I lost to him 4-2. to two. We had a bear of a match. If I had gotten myself there, been at the state tournament next week, who knows? I could have eaten it. So, our son went through the same kind of thing when he was a junior. 
lost to a guy in the sec in the semifinals of the sectional and was all down, but he came back. He took second place. They met in the finals of the state tournament the next week. He was state champion. Your son won the state championship. Yeah. That's awesome. But when he when he when he lost he he had a hard time. He'd always just go off the map, be by himself for a while. Whether he won or lost, you couldn't tell emotionally. I went in the locker room after that and I said, How are you doing, Josh? He said, Oh dad. This is really hard. And I started getting angry inside. <laughs> He's going to do the same thing I did. And thankfully, God helped me to control myself. And I, and I just said, you know, Josh, I know. I know it hurts. It hurts. But this next guy that you've got to, to get to third place and then be able to go to second, he, he's tough. You've got to get yourself ready. And, and so he was, he was able to do it. And I'm thankful that God helped me to not just chew them out, you know, like like, <laughs> like some coaches would do. I man, that's you. You said what you said. Setting goals is dangerous. When you said that, I mean, I've never heard that before, and that's pretty counterintuitive to what everybody says in the world nowadays. I mean, everything's about goals, goal setting, goal setting. If you well, don't what, have, a, what, you don't what, have a goal, you'll miss it every, or you'll hit it every time, right? <laughs> yep. But who's the goal? Who's the goal for? Ninety-nine point nine percent of the time. Yeah. And and so, what are you gonna do? You're, I mean, that's that, I mean, that's basically a goal. Is almost inherently. I never really thought of it this way until just hearing you say that. Basically, a goal in and of itself. You're you're making it an idol down darn near. I mean, maybe that's an objective or a, a desire of your heart. But yeah, when you when you make it a goal, that's basically saying, "Hey, I'm going to take the steps to attain that." That's uh, basically that's like you said earlier, I, idol worship. I guess I never never really thought about that. I think you almost it's like you almost have to have a, a vision. Without a vision, people perish. But a goal that's a pretty strong word. I mean, you're automatically eliciting um, you're you're eliciting your your directives to that, you know, and what's Proverbs 3, 5, verses 6, you know, lean not on your own understanding, but let, let the Lord guide your steps. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty darn powerful. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah, and, and well, one of the things I've been doing with the guys is uh, going through different passages in the Bible where there's questions that God asks. Like he asks Adam, you know, what is it, or where are you? He asks Eve, what is this you've done? He asked the rich young ruler, why do you call me good? And one of the last questions uh, is, what is your life in James? It's, it's, it's a speck of time, it's vapor. I got a DVD I just made <laughs> called Dust to Dust, and that's one of the uh, verses that I quoted. It's about this guy who came sheep hunting, and yeah, he died like four months after the hunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow. yeah, kind of, I'll, I'll give it to you here before we leave. But yeah, it's just so fleeting. And yeah, when you're busy, I mean, just think about where uh, where Satan would want you. He wants you focusing on that goal. He wants you focusing on you because you're, he's, he's got you locked in. You're not going to do anything for anybody. If that goal, if that, especially the more important that goal is to you and the more you want it, he can leave you alone and let you to it. But as we'll get to here, when you reach some of these goals, as we'll come to, you'll find that emptiness like we talked about to start off camera. So, um, what I kind of was hoping to do if we were able to do this in the summer was to meet, uh, uh, have this on a wrestling mat. Uh, you're, the barn that uh, Mr. Heil has where you guys wrestle or, or whatever, but I kind of figured, well we'll, well, we'll set it here. But as I mentioned earlier, how the, hunt, the campfire, I call that the hunter's altar. Um, what is that like? Because you're the beauty and maybe the curse of wrestling is you're totally vulnerable. You don't have any teammates. Yeah, wrestling can kind of be a team sport, but I would say it's more of an individual thing. It's all on you when you step out. And whether you put up the work, put in the work on the off season, or you know, practice, whatever, um, that's all, whatever the periods are, five, 10 minutes, everybody's gonna know. What is that like? What are, what are the good things and the bad things about that? Or what can you shed, what kind of light can you shed to, for us laymans and, and of the wrestling world of like what that's like and what that means to you as far as just the truth is going to come out. You know, you walk out into that mat and you shake that guy's hand and as soon as that 
whistle goes off, what happens? Well, you better you better have prepared yourself beforehand, especially mentally, so that when when it happens like that, then the referee starts the action that you are ready. If the adrenaline is not flowing already, you could be in big trouble. Do you want adrenaline? Do you yes. have adrenaline? Oh yes. Really? You want it flowing. So it's adrenaline. Uh, yeah. It, huh. Yeah. It, it's like, well, I guess doesn't that happen when you're hunting? No. You got you got to be unbelievably still because if you're too excited. The, the oh yeah, yeah. You get shake, it. You'll get buck right? fever. But I like when I what I'm. I always say when I'm stalking a bear, I never get it. It's like it's peaceful. Like you hear nothing, the world stops. Like if I'm gonna shoot a doe, I'll get it. It's kind of crazy. But if I'm stalking a bear and it's kind of like almost like life or death, I remember when it was wrestling, I'd be all nerves. But then as soon as the as soon as the whistle blew and we were wrestling, I was good. The the rest of the world, nothing ma nothing mattered. All my worry, anxiety was gone. So I don't know if there's something like that. Yeah, the adrenaline and the excitement, but as soon as that whistle blows. Like Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a game plan until they get punched in the face. I mean, what? And it's probably different for every wrestler. So I mean, yeah, maybe what's what's it like for yeah, you? Yeah, like, I, I tell young guys, you've got to figure out uh, how your body responds because you do have to be ready. You have to be mentally prepared, and you've got to be like, kind of like a an angry dog with the hair on the back of his neck sticking out. He's ready to fight. And I, I think that's the way it is in wrestling. Um, but you want to be relaxed at the same time so that the muscles are, are quick and, and you're responding. You're not thinking through everything, you know, muscle memory, because you've, you've drilled these moves over and over and over again. And, and what helped me so big, big time, a lot of people have asked me, uh, how did you ever go from not even qualifying at the state tournament and, and only being fifth in the NAIA? I'm, I'm one of only two wrestlers that are Olympic champions for the U.S. and not being a D1 athlete. You know, ben was national champion for Iowa State twice. How did you ever go from there? Well, part of it was a, a change of mentality of not focusing on the title. Focusing on the state champion too much hurt me. Focusing on being national champion in college hurt me because I wasn't handling it right. So come time when I made the world team, I was not focusing on being a world champ. I was not focusing on being an Olympic champion. I was focusing on, focusing on being the very best wrestler I could possibly be. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, do you work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward and inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. When I, when I understand who I am in Christ, I have this relationship with Him that is totally dependent on what Jesus did when he died for me. I'm, 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 I'm unbelievably secure in my relationship with him. He loves me. God loves me so much he sent his son to die for me. Jesus suffered unbelievable on the cross. If he could do that for me, well, I can go out there and I can wrestle with reckless abandon. Jesus suffered on the cross the pain of my sin. Why can't I wrestle in a way to honor him rather than looking for praise for myself. That was so freeing for me that I, I didn't have to any longer wrestle to make people happy. You know, when I was in college, my mom and dad come and watch me. I wrestled worse than I ever did, uh, not when they weren't there. Not because they were putting pressure on me. Dad, he, he loved me, and win or lose, he didn't care. Well, he cared, but... He wasn't putting pressure on me. It was myself because I wanted that praise, acceptance. I'd already been accepted by Dad. Boy, when I, I learned that and, and began to to make wrestling an act of worship to God, it changed changed completely. Where did you wrestle in college? I wrestled at the University of Wisconsin Stout. Okay, I I knew that, but I was wanting you to say U, that. So U W Stout. Yeah. When in doubt, go to Stout. Yeah. And, there, and you were uh, studying to be a shop teacher. Exactly. Did yeah. you ever become a shop teacher? I, I taught shop for one year. And that was enough. At Madison West, a big school right next to the University of Wisconsin, 
I accepted the job to be the head coach, wrestling coach. That was a disaster. This was after you had in no, the Olympics and everything? No. Oh. I had been in the World Championships, so I was one of the top guys in the U.S. I had qualified for the Olympic team. Yeah, I, I qualified well. No, I, we hadn't gone through the final national championships when I signed the contract. I had won the national tournament, but signed that contract. I should never have done that. I wanted to keep wrestling. I told the principal, I, I got I to gotta train. Uh, I'm going to have to take time off. He said, oh, that's, that's no problem. You, you can come. We'll, we'll give you plenty of time off. Sign right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, the teachers' union was so strong. They gave me a hard time taking time off. You know, nobody else gets time off. I didn't get paid when I was taking time off. So I'm coaching these kids, and then I'm over in, in Russia at, or in the Soviet Union at some tournament while they're getting ready for the state tournament. I wasn't even there for the guys. Two guys qualified for the state tournament. I wasn't even there to coach them. Well, what kind of a coach is that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's get into, into Dan Gable. But what was what was... I think I know the answer. I think you basically gave it. Would you say the catalyst for you? So, I mean, you went from high school not making it to the state tournament. Obviously, you pretty much had the ability, you know, kind of you proved that. But then you go to a national championship. Would you say the catalyst was just your to quit looking so far ahead and quit quit thinking of John Peterson? becoming, you know, national champion or, you know, this great wrestler to like, hey, I'm, I'm, basically you were wrestling for the Lord. I mean, was that basically the catalyst of your success? Is that, was that the light switch event, would you say, that changed yeah. things? I mean, took yeah. you to the next level. Yes, there were, there, there were quite a few different factors. I cut too much weight in uh, college. High school probably a little little more than I should have. When I got up to a right weight class, it was good for me. Wrestling was a lot more fun. You just stayed with the way God made you. Yeah. Yeah. And then being around workout partners, you know, you said wrestling is not a uh, a team sport, but I think it's actually more of a team sport than most team sports. You can be a good basketball player by just learning how to shoot mm -hmm. and dribble. You cannot learn wrestling without another body. You've got to have mm. really good wrestlers. You see teams, especially at high school teams, a really a good wrestler, there's going to be a good wrestler either a weight class below him or a weight class above because he's dragging them along. Mm. And he is only really good because he's able to get guys to train with. It's so important to have some workout partner. I mean, that's what Dan Gable was for us. And this is this was in your world championship. So he he graduated or he wrestled at Iowa State with Ben, your brother. Right. Right. And He's so, the same age as I am. I'm actually three days older than he is. Okay. So, but he graduated a year before I did. I took third grade twice. I was a little bit slower with uh, spelling and reading. So. What was her name? The girl that was uh, a year <laughs> year younger than you that you wanted to do? Don't no, give me that, John. <laughs> You could become an Olympic champion. You could have passed third grade if you really wanted to. <laughs> Kathy Cordes was her name. Okay. <laughs> Is she your wife? No. All right. Well, well I guess I guess we got some editing to do. Yeah, you got to do that. Well, no. It's okay. She lives over in uh, Germany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but your wife lives in your house, doesn't she? Yeah. I'd be more, more worried about her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She knows that story, so it, it's okay. I'm not worried. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so Dan Gable, what did he have that nobody else had? Uh, he had this enthusiasm for wrestling. He actually helped me with my uh, my seeing that I was worshiping wrestling too much. Really? He, he would come to wrestling practice and go, "Man, Peterson, can you believe it? We get to do this." And I think, "Oh wow." There's too many times when I was in college, I'd come to practice and. <clears throat> I sometimes come early because I was really tired from cutting weight and stuff, and I'd lay on the mat and maybe get a 10-minute nap. And, uh, and then I'd wake up. Well, maybe I was feeling pretty good then. 
But a lot of times, man, it just the 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 idea of having to do this again was not that exciting. So Dan helped me to see that you know the Bible says rejoice always. Even when you get beat, you're supposed to rejoice. That's crazy. But there's a deep joy that comes when you have this relationship with the Lord Jesus that nothing can take away. And, and verses like in Hebrews 12 where it says that Jesus, uh, fix your eyes on Jesus in this race, this Christian race that we're in. We're to lay aside the sin and the, the things that drag us down. It might be even some good things, but I've got to say no to them. Like our brother Phil would say, if you're going to be a good wrestler, you got You can't be like normal people. You can't eat like them. You can't sleep like them. <laughs> and and it says that fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He was experiencing joy in the middle of the most painful thing you could ever imagine, bearing the sins of the world and crucifixion was horrible. And yet, he could experience joy. I, I guess I I can I can be happy about a wrestling practice. So he, he just enjoyed it. Oh, Dan Dan was telling you that, or Dan? No. I, I, I actually told Dan that at the birthday party that they had for him at 72 years, when, when it was our 72nd birthday, a year ago. 73, they celebrated it because of COVID. And uh, they asked Ben and I to talk, talk about it to Dan and to the crowd. And that's what I told Dan while, while we, were, uh, we were talking to the crowd. I did that Dan, I said, Dan, thank you. You helped me to deal with my not being able to rejoice always. Bible tells us to rejoice always. And Dan, you helped me with that. You showed me how something that so, is so hard is wrestling practice. And I don't think I said this, but... Yeah, that's easy for you to be happy, Dan, because you're going to turn me and pin me and <laughs> get me in all kinds of crazy positions. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so he, he loved it. He loved every minute. He loved every as aspect of it. So nothing, it was nothing, nothing was work to Dan Gable. He loved every, he loved the suck. He embraced the suck. There was no suck for him. He enjoyed everything. And I know you told me once before, like, he wanted to be in every position 10,000 times or something that was kind of like the goal of it. I mean, he... He was like a savant, like his whole life was wrestling, that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you lead him to the Lord, or...? No, somebody else did, but I, I, I had a lot of influence on him. Did a little watering, fertilizer? He, he, he would tell us, he would come up to our camp, work, work at the father-son camp that we had. And uh, he would say things like, yeah, I, I need to come here, because you guys keep me, keep me on the straight and narrow. That was pretty cool. One uh, one thing when we met for lunch that just I don't know it was it was so powerful. I felt when you were sharing your story in another interview, when you were talking about your experience in the so maybe let's get into the Olympics, and you were talking about how you were fate you were up against the Russian. You didn't call him by name. It was the Russian. And I mean, like, right away, you get into this, like, semblance of Rocky. Like, when you stepped on the mat against the Russian, it was the United States of America versus Russia. And I think that is totally lost in the Olympics. I mean, the Olympics was, like, the greatest thing I ever saw as a kid. I mean, it just made you believe in something so much bigger than yourself. You know, and nowadays, you know everybody, these people, they seem to be individuals. It doesn't seem like the representation of the country is nearly what it was before. And that really struck me. It was you against the Russian. I mean, did you, did you ever feel that weight of the country? Like, to be representing the United States of America... You know, I mean, obviously that's an honor, and, I, and, and not that one probably should feel the weight of it, because, I mean, you earned every right to be there. I'm not, I'm not implying that you should have felt all this pressure, but, I mean, what an honor that is. And 
the fact that you put it that way, the Russian, it just shows a different point of time. You know, that was, well, 50 years ago now. That that was, well, it's just the values were different than they are today. It's, it's more of the individual thing now than, hey, I have the honor of living in the greatest country in this world, and, and, and I am here. The, the, the humility that you brought or that I just could oozed out of you when you said that, that really, that's what captured me. I mean, any thoughts on that? Like, you know, I'm sure you knew the guy's name and you knew a lot about him, but probably nothing like today. I don't know where, where I'm kind of going with this and what I'm asking you from, but, or, or from you in this, but well, is I, that lost today? Do you, do you feel a little bit? That, that sense of representing your country, and it's not just John Peterson versus Nikolai. This is United States versus Russia. Because that means a lot more to me. That I want to watch. John versus Nikolai, I'm not so interested in. It's just a couple of wrestlers beating each other's well, brains on the mat. Well, it, it is in the wrestling world. It's still there in the wrestling world. Um, back when I was competing, it was the Soviet Union. So the guy that Ben and I lost to was a guy from Georgia. So it's the Georgian country now. But back then he was wrestling for the Soviet Union. And so, but, but we, we kind of called them the dirty Russians, you know. The dirty Ruskies. Got to beat the dirty Ruskies. <laughs> and he's become a friend. I've seen him several times. Uh, he came here to the United States back in the 90s. Uh, went to Ben's home. Or, well, like Ben saw him at a tournament and, and spent time with him anyway. He was in our home here in, in Comstock. And this is the guy who beat me in 72, beat Ben in 76, was a four-time world champ. Um, Two-time gold medalist then? We never, we never did beat him. We had some close matches. First, what was his name? His name was Levan Tedeschevelli. Tedeschevelli, that's a that's Georgia name, man. Okay. Um, think you could beat him now? Here's a, here's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got, he got real healthy. Um, here's a story about Gable. First time I wrestled Teddy, Ted Chevelli, we call him Teddy. He won the World Championships in 71. January of 72, we went to uh, the Soviet Union to compete, and there's a big tournament called the Tbilisi Tournament, capital of Georgia. That's where Teddy's from. I wrestled him in second or third match, and he pinned me in the second period. I come off the mat, and Dan Gable comes over to me, and he says, John, John, you know that was your wrestle? It's not like nowadays they have it. it. You have an individual coach for each one of the guys on the team. We had one coach, so he hadn't told me who this guy was, but Dan knew. I said, no, who was he? He said, oh, that's Ted Chevelli. He won the World Championships. I said, Dan, why didn't you tell me that before the match? <laughs> He said, this is classic Gable. He said, well, I knew you weren't ready. Well, the next month and a half, he spent, well, maybe only a month, he spent almost every day working on me to help me to beat Teddy Chevelli. Two on one. To a double leg. I took him down with it three times. He only got one point for takedown back then. He still beat me, 5-3. But that's a long way from getting pinned in the second yeah. time. I was making progress. That was huge for me, that kind of stuff. So you won... So the story that you're looking for is my final match before I won the gold medal, I think. Um, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a Soviet guy. It was a... I, I had beaten a Soviet guy. I had beaten him 20 to 4. We had all these close matches before. He beat me 2 to 3. I beat him 3 4. Really close matches. All of a sudden, I was I was wrestling like a maniac at that, that Olympics. This is the 76. This is 76. So I had wrestled him and the guy who was returning world champ. I'd beaten him 14 to 4, guy from Germany. And I was just, I was going. So I got one match left. I beat him, I'm like, Olympic champion. 
Ben and I were in this back room doing our warm up. We prayed together, and then we were walking towards the arena. And I made a mistake. <coughs> I should never have looked at the TV monitor. It would be kind of like if there's a TV monitor over this doorway, and I'm walking through the doorway to the hallway to get to the arena. Jim McKay comes on. He says, in a few minutes, we're going to switch to the wrestling hall and watch John Peterson attempt to win the gold medal. That's when this fear just gripped me. I'm just like a high school kid again. <laughs> I was thinking people all over the United States are going to be watching this match. I'm representing the, the USA. If I blow this match, tch, I'm a bomb. <laughs> I don't know what, what all I was thinking, but I started crying. Ben kind of patted me on the back and said, oh, Johnny, you'll be okay. Well, I needed more than that. I needed to think about the truth. Forget about the crowd. Forget about the TV. What's true? John, you've beaten the best guys in this weight class. You're prepared for this. And one of the verses that I memorized earlier that year when I had mono, I was sick in the hospital for five days and in a, in a bad case. Couldn't train for a whole month. I memorized 1 Peter 1.13. Preparing your mind for action and being self-controlled, set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. John, you are not setting your hope on being an Olympic champion. Oh yeah, I wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to win that match. But that that thinking calmed my heart. Thinking about, hey, there's some things you need to do. This Turkish guy, he's got these moves that coach has told you about. You're in good shape. You know wrestling. Just go out there and by the time I got on the podium to wrestle, I had totally forgotten about all that stuff and I was ready to go. That's what I was talking about, this whole idea of, of, of being ready mentally, emotionally, spiritually. That's good stuff right there. So, yeah, when, uh, when you're weak, he's strong. And so, I mean, you, you just fell on your faith. I mean, that, that's what brought lifted that pressure off your shoulders. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ben, you described, I remember our conversation again, you described uh, when you, either Ben looked over at you or you looked over at Ben, like one of you guys was coming to wrestle like right after the other one had just won gold. I, I believe, am I, are you, are you recalling okay, this that? Is, yeah, this is 72. Okay, so this is when Ben had just this, won, this won is, the gold medal? This is why I would tell people uh, that the silver medal there was more exciting to win than the gold medal. <laughs> that yeah. always gives me butterflies, man, <laughs> to look at that. Now don't be worshiping these things. No, I won't. Uh, I, I had a hunter. I don't have it in here. I had a hunter just recently he gave me this bar of copper. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. He remodeled some building and gave me this bar of copper. And I'm thinking, man, that's pretty cool. The thing's pretty heavy. It's like three pounds. I'm like, this is probably worth several hundred dollars. Well, then I looked it up. But the value of copper is worth nine bucks. <laughs> here, can you hold those up for us? Yeah, you hold them up for us. To the camera. Perfect. Cool. Can I do the honors? Maybe get one. Oh man, yeah, they're heavy. That's pretty cool. People the gold smaller than is it? Is it solid gold? It's not solid gold. Yeah. It's gold plated. Yeah, I figured this might. Actually, my girls asked me that it, this morning. It, talk, it costs about. Uh, I think it costs one hundred and thirteen dollars to produce. I read an article about it in Montreal. So gold was only uh, 300 an ounce back then, but still, there's not much gold in it. Yeah. But it's gold plated. That's pretty cool. So, so the story that I tell is getting the silver medal was more exciting than gold because of the way it happened at the end. I had lost to Ted Chiavelli, the Soviet guy. Ben had tied with the Soviet wrestler, struck off. So for him to win the gold, they didn't break the ties back then, they do now. Uh, if they had broke the tie and had the same rules they have now, Ben would have won. 
um, for him to win, he needed to do better against the opposing guys that they would both wrestle. So he knew in his last match that he had to pin the Bulgarian. I was wrestling the East German. He had pinned me in the World Championships the year before, but I'm wrestling a whole different level, and I'm confident I'm going to beat this guy. And so I had to fight thinking more about Ben's match than mine. I started in the middle circle. I'm halfway through my match. Ben starts against the Bulgarian mat next to me, and I'm really tempted to look at see how Ben's doing, but I can't. I've I got to concentrate on my match. So my match is over. Referee's raising my hand. That means I'm silver medalist. I quick look over to see how Ben is doing it, and as I look, <laughs> Ben has that guy on his back. Before I could even walk off the mat, he won by the fall and he'd be Olympic champion. So I didn't walk off the mat. I ran right over to him, and I gave him a big hug. And uh, we've got a picture of us. Someone took a picture of us there on the mat, hugging each other. That's pretty awesome. When, when we came back here and they did a homecoming celebration for us in Comstock, um, Stanley Jurgensen's field, he mowed it, had a wagon out there with some bales on it. Governor, state, it's up there. Christian music group from Minneapolis, they had come up and sang. When the whole thing was over, a newspaper reporter from the Pioneer Press showed me that picture of us hugging each other. Because it was on the sports page. People from all over the country would send these pictures to mom and dad. We just say Peterson, Comstock, Wisconsin. Well, they'd get it. <laughs> he said, "Man, that must have, that must have been the greatest thing that ever happened to you." So I looked at that picture and I thought, "Now, how do I answer this?" And I'm so thankful that God helped me to say, "No, that was exciting, but there's something much more important to me." When I was 12. I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart to save me from my sin. I'm trusting in him. That's more important to me. So, you know, I'm, I'm thankful. Thankful to be an Olympic champion, be a silver medalist. But it can't compare it to a relationship with the Lord. That's going to last forever. Boom. Love it. So what did that? <clears throat> Were you willing did, to... Did your girl see, this, see that? I saw that. Our daughter... <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the I back of the gold, but not on. that she's, one. She's 30, uh, what is she, 33 now? Okay. She put that on there when she was in second grade because they asked me to show it to the kids in her class. Uh, <laughs> and she said, Dad, you got to cover those guys up. Yeah, so they're, are they totally naked? Yes. I guess yes. of two naked dudes standing at <laughs> each other, yeah. That's, maybe they were I ahead had, of their time. I had fun uh -huh. telling Ben that my gold medal is better than his because he, I don't have these two skinny naked guys in the house. <laughs> So did you see? Yeah, yeah. That one I looked at. So you mentioned uh, Ben had a hard time after he won the Olympics, or maybe it was just getting out of wrestling. But he struggled maybe uh, a shift in life, and, and maybe, maybe maybe that's not something you'd want to share. But is, is I had that, had that in a note. Does that sound right? Well, I may have told you that when he won his uh, NCAA title, his first year he won it as a junior. The next month was the most miserable month of his life. Because he was expecting that national title to satisfy him in a way that only God can satisfy. Which is a big lesson for me. That, that helped me in my disappointment of getting fifth in the NAIA. I was disappointed, but in a different way. I was learning that, oh, fifth place is okay. John, you, you got yourself ready for this tournament. There's a reason that you lost. God can use this. He can use wins. He can lose losses. Use them. I want to be like Kyle Schneider. <laughs> yeah, that roll right off your back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it didn't, but I thought, what? That was in March. In August, I made the United States World Team. I was fifth in the NAIA in August, or in March. In August, I made the U.S. World Team. Because now I was beginning to see that, hey, 
you've been defining yourself too much by wrestling. Stop doing that. Yeah. And then going to a training camp with Ben, he got invited to the Pan Am training camp that spring. He called the coach up and said, hey, can my brother come along too? And Coach Doug Blue Ball, I'm forever grateful to him. He said, yeah, if he'll work as hard as you do, he can come to camp, we want him there. And that's when I got trained with the best guys in the country and, and I started just going at a different level, wrestling 20 pounds heavier and I had been, or 17 pounds heavier. So the old adage, you're a product of your environment. You got in that environment, like you were talking earlier, how those people just elevated your game, and yeah, yeah, the old adage, you never want to be the smartest person in the room, and yeah, you can't soar with the eagles if you're hanging around with the turkeys. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds to me like that happened a few times in your wrestling career where you kind of had a little bit of ebb and flow, you know, you kind of reached a certain level, and then, I don't know, maybe was there, there was some complacency or some pride took over and you maybe kind of dipped or maybe some health issues. But, I mean, yeah, it wasn't just this. And I, and I think that's, that's the one thing that I've learned with people. Part of the best things in my job, I meet lots of different men, lots of different walks of life. All of them are successful in at least something, right? Is that every single one of them had roadblocks. There was never this easy, straight, upward trajectory towards success in anything. There's, there's ups and downs and... and those who keep putting one foot in front of the other, <laughs> like, like, like Peter said, uh, uh, I mean, I, I come back to this one all the time. Um, when, uh, when Jesus was talking about, uh, you know, the Holy Sacrament, you know, and uh, people sort of, man, this is a tough teaching. Uh, we're out of here. And Jesus said, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter's like, where is there to go? You have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? And, uh, yeah, you, you, you can't just quit, you know, you got to figure out what's real, what's truth and you stick with it or, you know, like a dog going back to his own vomit, you know, and I think that life experience, it, it's sometimes there's certain things that you only get through those adversities, through those trials and tribulations. I have to believe, or I guess that kind of leads into my, one of my questions is like, what was your toughest, and, may, and if you shared it, that's fine, but your toughest trial or tribulation on the mat and off the mat? You know, John, Peter, James, they all said we're to have joy. We talked about that, I think, off camera. It's hard to have joy when you're going through adversity, but maybe what was your toughest that maybe changed your life the most? Probably, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure ultimately probably cemented your faith. Um, on the mat and off, your, your biggest trials? Well, the ones, the ones uh, on the mat and off together <laughs> would have to be uh, 75 leading up to 76 Olympics. I was on the world team, qualified for the world team in 1975, but uh, that June I had torn a bicep tendon in my shoulder. I went to five different doctors to find out what was wrong with it. Um, so a couple weeks before the World Championships, I told the coach, there's no way I can compete. So my teammate took that spot. Um, this doctor told me, you've got a torn bicep tendon, we should, we should repair it. But if we do, there's no way you can compete in the Olympics. They didn't have orth orthoscopic surgery back then, so it would have been a major recovery thing. He said, we'll get you with a uh, physical therapist and build the muscles back up and we'll see see how you do. And, and if it works okay, then after the Olympics, if it's bothering you again, come back to me and we'll repair it. So I, I worked on these exercises constantly for, you know, two, three months to get the muscles around that shoulder all good. And uh, so that, that was in October, by the time December came around, I was competing and doing well. Went over the, to the tournament that we wrestled in the Soviet Union every year and came back uh, just dragging, tired as can be. Doc checked me in the hospital, I had a bad case of mono. That's what I was telling him about before. Mm -hmm. While I was in the hospital, Nancy 
my wife prayed for me one simple prayer. Lord, help John not only to make the Olympic team, but to win a gold medal for your glory so that people all over the world can hear about you. Couldn't train for a whole month. April, once a day, coach, uh, the doctor said you can train. That was over about a week and a half before the Olympic trial tournament. And he said, man, you're doing great. You can train as much as you want. Blood level's fine. But that morning I had woken up with a little sore on my knee, and I wouldn't normally have not talked to anybody about it, but since I was going to the doctor, I said, hey, can you look at this thing? And he said, yeah, your blood is fine, but this thing, you, you've got to really watch that. It could get an infection, and sure enough, a couple days later, the thing was swollen up. The night before the Olympic trial tournament, it was really puffed up, and I was debating, should I wrestle or not? I mean, it didn't bother me. I'd work out that day, and it didn't affect my wrestling. But that's when the doc said, if we if, if in your wrestling you drive that infection into the knee, you can have some real problems. But I went ahead and wrestled. I hadn't competed for three months. I was like a key demo, ready to go. I had a great tournament. Won, won the trial tournament. So that means I'm the top guy. One guy comes up, I have to beat him. Best two out of three to make the team. So those off the mat times, God was really working on me. When I had mono, like I was telling before, that's when I memorized 1 Peter 1.13. I did a study on a guy who said, you know, God, God uses uh, wins and losses. He uses injuries in, in our lives as athletes to the suffering kind of thing is how he really builds us. Be still and know that I'm God. He forced you to be still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Ben and I have talked about it. You know, part of the reason that he did not repeat as Olympic champion was he was overworking in the last three, four months, trying to catch up on some of the stuff where he took some time off after 72. And uh, oh, while I was resting, he was overtraining. Mm. Interesting. <clears throat> In our former conversation, you said, you know, I don't remember where it is, but, the, well, the Beatitudes, the meek shall inherit the earth. Just Matthew 5, I believe. It is. And you said, because uh, that's, I know that was kind of a popular, in, in the world of masculinity, you know, that you don't, you don't take any crap from anybody, you know, that nobody, nobody talks to me this way, nobody does me wrong, or they're going to pay for it. I mean, that's kind of the way I, had, that's my mind, that was being a man. And, uh, but you said, uh, meek is not weak. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> because I believe that Jesus was fully masculine. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, maybe, don't take this too much. I haven't given it a whole lot of thought, but, which is most things in life, but, but I almost feel like Jesus was kind of fully masculine, fully feminine, you know, not, not to take anything away from Jesus, so don't look into that too much, but, like, he was everything, right? I mean, he was, he, he, he was so merciful, and, but, but then, I mean, that's what it takes a real man to be vulnerable, to, you know, turn the other cheek, and, I guess maybe the, where your motives are, your purpose as to why you're doing that. If you're just so afraid, yeah, maybe that's not exactly, um, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's what Jesus was going for. It's not that you're so afraid, it's just you're so um, secure in yourself that I, I know there's nothing good that's going to come of me retaliating against this guy or, or somebody that's doing me wrong. And as the Bible says, to pour, pour coals over their head, he who does bad to you, you know. Love God above all things, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemy. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll let you, I'll shut up and let you, what does it mean to you that meek is not weak? What is, what does meekness mean to you? Well, one of the things you learn in the sport of wrestling is that it's, a, it's an aggressive sport. It's a, it, it takes... Uh, takes a tough mentality. But we have a, 
one of the rules in wrestling is that you cannot use unnecessary roughness. That that's a point for the other guy if you show uh, unnecessary roughness. And we as wrestlers, we all know when we've crossed that line. Some guys they take cheap shots at you. Referees on that side of you, and they they got their knuckles over here, and they're just grinding it into your ribs, like they're just trying to irritate you. And I, and I had to learn to not let the anger of the injustice that might be going on. Maybe the referees make a cheating call. That happens a lot internationally. That's injustice. It's okay to have righteous anger then. Jesus was righteously angry when there was injustice going on in the temple. And he got in there with a whip and turned the tables over because he was angry. The Bible says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Our dad showed us that he had discipline with that when he got too aggressive in his spanking. He never beat us. But sometimes he'd cross that line. And he would come to us at night and he would say, John, you know why I had to spank you. You did this, this, and this. And I, and I love you, so I'm going to discipline you. But I was a little over angry. Will you forgive me? And I thought, wow. That's powerful. Yeah. Sometimes I'd have my hand back there. That was kind of stupid. And I'd be thinking, oh man, he's going to come to me tonight and he's going to ask me to forgive him. And I am not going to forgive him. <laughs> but he would wait. Patiently wait. And every time I would break down, I'd forgive him. I'd say, it's okay, Dad. I understand. God is like that. He disciplines us. He is unbelievably strong, and yet he's meek, but not weak. He does it right. He's patient. He's merciful. So in the sport of wrestling, we've got to be careful. Um, with Athletes in Action, we, we had a competing team back in the 70s and uh, early 80s. We would wrestle against some of the best college and universities in the country. And we'd wrestle the University of Minnesota every other year, Wisconsin every other year, all the Big Ten, a lot of the Big Ten schools. We'd win most of our wrestling matches. We had a halftime program where one of our guys would share just three-minute talk on how they had come to know the Lord Jesus. And, then, and somebody would give a five-minute talk on how a person becomes a Christian. I often would give that talk because, you know, I'm the silver medalist, <laughs> an Olympic champ. And sometimes we'd get comments back from the crowd and some people would say, man, you know, I kind of like to become a Christian, but boy, that Peterson, he was awful mean out on that man. And I would look back and I'd examine, you no, know, was I overly aggressive with this guy? I had to check, see, now am I going over that line of unnecessary roughness? Most of the time, that was just as an excuse if somebody didn't want to trust in Jesus. Mm -hmm. A misunderstanding of what a Christian is. As someone who has trusted in the Lord, I should be the hardest working uh, guy, the athlete who is the best teammate, really looking out for the other guys, and is, is, is doing you know, sharpening his craft in the right way. Make sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, you're... Yeah, maybe it's your your why behind what you're doing probably reveals it. You know, why, why are you retaliating or why are you not retaliating? If you're not retaliating because you don't want to get beat up, um, I guess that's maybe not necessarily right but if you're not retaliating because you're like i'm not uh yeah yeah I, i'm not going to stoop to this level and then have this escalate um so yeah i think that makes perfect sense that yeah you're you, you're you're coming at it as from a servant's heart rather than um john peterson's great you know yeah yeah servant's heart versus a, a, a prideful heart yeah that's yeah. where it was important for me to check my my motive every time. And I'm sure I was not always right. Yeah. Yeah, undoubtedly. Um, who, 
who had who impacted you the most in your faith and how what what human you know maybe well, it would it would, it would be really hard to just put my finger on one person who has impacted my relationship with the Lord the most. Um, w one of my college friends on our wrestling team um, didn't truly become a Christian. He, he, he grew up hearing about the Lord and, and being a, a religious guy, you'd say. We had several spiritual conversations, but I never really... Um, talk to him what it really meant that I am trusting in the Lord Jesus. So he got pretty upset with me after I graduated. And he said, John, how come... He, he became a Christian when he was a senior in college. He was a year younger than me. And uh, he said, John, how come you didn't talk to me about this? You knew all this stuff. Um... I've told people that I, I think God's decided, okay, you didn't talk to me a lot when you were in high school, talk to, about me a lot when you were in high school and college. I'm going to have you talking about me the rest of my life. I'm going to put you in a position where you can do that <laughs> with the platform you have because of being an Olympic champion. So Hector Cruz has influenced me big time. And that's your college that's roommate? That's my college, college roommate. Ben and I, in the relationship that we had with each other, we sharpened each other. Proverbs uh, twenty-seven seventeen is true. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We sharpened each other wrestling-wise, big time, and we sharpened each other spiritually. Um, I can't wait to read his book, Road <laughs> to Gold. So he just, uh, I, I wasn't aware that he wrote one. So yeah, I'm excited to, and I'm looking for John Peterson's autobiography as well, or a biography, which is auto. Auto must be when you write it yourself, right? I don't know, but your story. There, you said you're going to write your book when you're 80, so <laughs> Lord willing. But There are other guys, a number of guys on the Athletes in Action team who sharpened me a lot spiritually. Tom Keeley, Gene Davis, a guy named Bob Anderson, who when I won the national tournament in 1973, he used third place, and Greg Hicks, who's AIA guy, took my spot on the team in 75. He sharpened me spiritually. Reed Lanfear, Stephen Barrett, a guy I go to Russia with and uh, was in Mongolia with him this last summer, and also in Israel. We were there together. He's been a huge influence in my, in my life spiritually. This Bob Anderson guy, I'm not an Athletes in Action staff yet, he looks up at me, I'm on the victory stand, we're getting our medals, he says, Peterson, when are you going to come, when are you going to get in God's will and come on Athletes in Action team? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. Get in God's will? That's a good, that's a good <laughs> persuasive tool. Are you going to join God's will ever? Or what are you doing with your life? Well, I'll tell you what it did for me. I was planning on filling out an application. Well, I left that application on my desk for a whole month, stubbornly thinking, who does this guy think he is that he's got this direct line of God that he knows what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> and athletes in action, I you know you've shared that with me before, but what is that? Athletes so, in action. Bill Bright was the starter of Campus Crusade for Christ. It's called Crew here in the United States now, back in the 50s. And they started a wrestling team when a guy was watching a music group on the college campus attract a crowd, and this guy was thinking, you know, if this music group can attract a crowd, tell people about Jesus, I bet we could do that same thing athletically. So we started with a basketball team, and, and the next year we had the wrestling team in 1967. And so we started out as a competing team, like I was telling you. Now we work on college campuses all over the U.S., and then across the world. So you're mentoring, discipling? Mentoring, leading people to Christ, win, build, send. Win, build, send, okay. Yeah. Win them to Christ, build them in their, disciple them, win, uh, build them in their relationship with the Lord and then send them out. The goal of Athletes in, his action, athletes in Action is to see a, a Christ follower on every team in every nation, in every sport. 
Love it. Anything else you want to add that I haven't asked you? And I'll give you my kind of final thoughts, my takeaways. But I know we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. So what's uh, I'll ask you a couple. I'll ask you this question. So what what's John Peterson? So after. So basically through, and you get into as much detail as you want or be as abbreviated as you want, but after the Olympics, you know, since the Olympics, what is, you know, or what, what has John Peterson done? What, what have you been doing? You know, so you're, I mean, that's how you're making your living is through, is it with, through Athletes in Action? Or, I mean, that, that's your livelihood now, that's your life is mentoring young athletes. Yes, I've been on staff with Athletes in Action for 49 years now. I guess Bob was right. <laughs> and then that's funded by? Uh, people who are interested in what I do. So basically it's a ministry. And it's a ministry. Okay. My church supports us as a missionary. Uh, after I retired from wrestling, and uh, I, I competed on our national with our national team for 10 years, from 71 to 1980. Ben and I both tried out for the 1980 Olympics. Ben made that team. I missed it by one. Um, then we had three of our uh, athletes and action guys that were working in Europe, in Vienna, Austria, going into Eastern Europe during those communist days. That would be another time we could talk about yeah. stories from that. Um, so for three years, that's all I did, just train, train guys getting ready for the 84 Olympics. I was coaching them. We'd go to Poland, train with their team all the Eastern European countries. And then I, I worked with an underground Bible school that brought Bible training into those countries. So then in 1991, when 89, 90, the walls came down, communism was falling apart. We no longer had to live in Vienna. We could go into those countries and live there. So. It was either moved to Russia and, and, and work there or come back to the United States. I came back and started working on a college campus. So I've been going to University of Minnesota in Augsburg on a weekly basis. Um, 2006 or someplace in there, started going to St. Cloud. Now every week I go to Eau Claire. So four different college campuses now I'm, I'm working on just Working with wrestlers, I'm kind of now focused. Yeah, <laughs> well, you speak their language. <clears throat> I mean, that's and that's kind of what I feel the Lord's called me to do is like I speak the language of hunters is to witness to them. Yeah, and so how much of your so I mean you're probably mentoring them, you know, not just obviously in their faith, but just just life, and and that's that's probably what's opening the doors to share Christ, obviously, yeah, and then absolutely. it probably comes wrestling, life, Christ, yeah. something like that, anyways. Yeah. So the, here's the takeaways that I, I mean, this is what really struck me on this. Setting goals is dangerous. I've, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I kind of, you saying that, like, I've been, I've been recognizing that without really recognizing it. You know, like, the Tony Robbins stuff and, you know, the, um, law of attraction like you know you name it or declare it and name it and claim it or something like that i mean and that's a lot of that's a lot of that stuff's in the church too but like yeah that, that's really dangerous now i think that, that is that's dangerous saying, god god you don't know what uh, i should be doing right james what was he saying james um instead of saying i'm going to go here and do this and that you should say lord willing yeah. i used to hear that a lot when i was a kid yeah i don't hear it that much anymore yeah yeah so that's like telling God, this this is what you got to do. Yep, you're with me, God, or you're not. This is where I'm heading. Yeah, that's they, that's dangerous. Yeah, they 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 pull these verses out of their context. When mm -hmm. Jesus said, "Pray anything in my name," you've got it. If it's the Lord's will. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Praying in God's name means he he wants it. It's His will, not mine. Right. And so when I when I say I want that national title, and I deserve it. You have coaches say that sometimes. <laughs> Our college coach used to take us over sometimes when we were in the finals of a tournament and show us the trophies that are on the table. There, so 
Just imagine that trophy's in your back pocket and that guy's trying to take it away from you. Well, what does that kind of works up this anger? Mm -hmm. you know? And some guys, when they become Christians, this is what I found out when I was working with AIA and I became the coach and I would work with our schedule. We were scheduling a match with uh, Buffalo State and they had wrestled our AIA guys a couple years before that. Two of the guys became Christians and, and they became terrible wrestlers. They didn't know how to change mm. from getting themselves motivated by anger and hatred. Now they're supposed to love these people. Mm -hmm. Now how do I get ready for a match? So I had a long talk with the coach because he told me, there's no way, I'd, I'd never wrestle you guys. And I had a long talk to him about that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Well, they had a misunderstanding of what Christianity really is. They could become very good wrestlers if they just worked at it and changed their motives. Well, and I wonder maybe from a coaching standpoint, communicate what you got to, you know, the, uh, when you say public speaking, you got to take the temperature in the room, you know, and just in life in general. Well, so you maybe you got to say, hey, you need to get out there, choke slam that guy, you pin him, and then you give him a hug and you hand him the Bible, you know, and just say, hey, man, you want to be a better wrestler? You need Jesus here. I mean, you know what I mean? Exactly, and probably you just thing. couldn't communicate, like in their mind, yeah. Yeah, he just, yeah, don't go out there with anger. Go out there. And it's like, the Lord, you're wrestling for, for the Lord. You know, and if a coach doesn't, you know, isn't isn't a Christian, that's that's not going to come out of his mouth. Maybe it would. I mean, if he knew his his wrestler well enough. But, yeah, I, I guess I could kind of see that. I've wrestled with that for sure. I mean, and i I got to believe every Christian does. I mean, yeah, you're born again, but you're still, you still have your old flesh, you know, that you're, Refi that you're refining, you know, you're being sanctified, and so there's times where I think you fall back on your own flesh that we you don't even really realize it, and then all of a sudden you start to notice like, whoa, 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 how did I get here? It's just like walking into a woods, and you know where you're going, and you're heading straight, and all of a sudden, whoa, the sun was off my left, now it's back to my right. How did that happen? Like the, like a change in the wind. Uh, what's uh, the verse, you know, about the spirit, the uh, the spirit is just like the wind. It comes John, and goes. You don't know where it comes from. John, you don't know where John it's going. Three, John 3. And like that's one thing I've noticed as a as a guide. I mean, I don't think I've... I think one time in 25 years, I've heard somebody notice a wind switch before I did. Or at least vocalize it. They maybe notice it. But I, I mean, I'll be like... As soon as I feel wind anywhere other than in my face, it's it's automatic. Wow. And I kind of believe that that's, that's kind of what I'm starting to notice. Um, as you follow Christ, you get more sensitive. Your discernment, your instinct is honed. You know, you don't even think about it, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it, it, as we, we, we read our Bibles and we learn more about how God works in us, I think what you're talking about uh, is Paul... He talks about this, the Spirit commands. This is one of Tom Keeley, I mentioned him. He really helped me with this whole thing. First Thessalonians 5.19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. And in the context, there's all these good things that we should do. We have a choice. Am I going to do the things that I know God wants me to do? As I read my Bible, I find out how He wants me to live. Am I going to... He's putting that fire in me. you got to do this. I have to choose. Then Ephesians uh, 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, don't make him sad. And in the context, there's all these things we shouldn't do. Don't lie, don't steal. Be angry, do not sin. That, that one I talked about my dad is there. We have a choice every day. Are we going to do these things that we shouldn't do? Now, we can see the Christian life as this, all these things. Got to do all this stuff. Can't do that stuff. That's what we, we, a lot of people define Christians. So they, oh, they can't have any fun because God takes all the fun away. They got to do all this stuff. Got to go to church. Got to read your Bible. Got to do all these things. Instead of seeing it as Galatians says, walk by the Spirit. Don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And he gives a whole list of things we shouldn't do. We have to fight against <laughs> Drunkenness, yeah. envy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I have, I've just just read that very recently. Yeah, <laughs> and then he says, "But um, walk by the Spirit." 
fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, goodness, self-control. Well, that's depending on Him. That's the difference between keeping this list, my doing it, and my avoiding these things. It's letting God, the Holy Spirit, do it through me. And we do that by being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Do not get drunk with wine. That's debauchery. Be filled with the Spirit. Well, there are the, the tense. I'm not a Greek scholar, but my friend studied Greek and he'd tell me about this stuff. It's different. I accept him filling me. I can't fill myself with the Spirit. God can. Does he want me to be filled with the Spirit? Well, yeah, he says. It's a command. There's where I've... 1 John 5, 14. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know what we have, what we've asked of him. If I ask him to fill me with his spirit, I'm mad at Nancy because you now we don't have done something. God, you tell me to love that woman. I don't even like her. you got to help me. I need your spirit to help me. I'm accepting you, filling me with your spirit. Before you know, you changed in my heart and back falling in love with my wife. So, what really, I'm going off on this whole thing. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're sweeping the double leg, John. Yeah, come over top and get around him. I love it. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1, Peter really throws you a curveball. He says, you have everything you need for life and godliness. That's verse 3. And then verse 5, he says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control. He lists another list, just like Paul does. Well, now, what's the deal? You said, I have everything. Why do I have to make this effort? I have to take some supplement every day? Yeah. I think you were talking in, in, in one of the, the podcasts that I listened to this morning about about how you have to, uh, when you exercise muscles, you tear them down. Yeah. I don't think that's the exact way. I used to hear that all the time when I was lifting weights. You don't actually tear it down. You cause the muscle to have to work to expand its size so that it can get more nutrients yeah. to it. Okay, yeah. And if you don't do that, you know, you're going to get flabby and you're not going to keep improving. So you've got to make a choice. Am I going to stress that muscle, work it? Mm -hmm. And when I do, it increases the ability of each muscle fiber. You only have so many muscle fibers. You, would, you inherited them from mom and dad. Mm -hmm. But when you choose to do the exercise, you increase the ability of each muscle fiber to get nutrients to it and to get the lactic acid out of there so mm -hmm. you don't cramp up, mm -hmm. so you get yourself in better shape. Mm -hmm. And it's like that spiritually. Peter says, you got to exercise those spiritual muscles. You've got to choose to let God get in there and love people through you. Be kind to people through you. Rejoice no matter what the circumstances are. Exercise self-control. That is exercise so faith to grow. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you've yeah, got to exactly. be stretched so that faith is allowed in there. So yeah, I guess if you're following Christ, you recognize that like, all right, yep, I, I can't do this. I can't lift 100 pounds right now. I'm only at 90. But this, and seeing it for what it is, to take joy in that trial and tribulation, because that's that's your exercise. It's just like Dan Gable, to take joy in there doing your drills, you know. it's You're grinding it out, and you're dog tired, and you're beat down, and you don't see how it's ever going to pay off, because you want your flesh wants the satisfaction now. But like, no, 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 the reward is coming, but not right now. He's he's refining you, yeah. Yeah, yeah I like that. Yeah, that's a good analogy, yeah. Um, to make it fun, that's one thing that I've struggled with in business, you know, I, I've, I've often said, you know, guiding, I work the rest of the year so that I can afford to go, afford to go guiding, and that's kind of what I've done for 25 years, that's the fun part, everything else, 
it's not so fun. I'm, I'm trying must, to find you must fun. You charge these guys for your guiding. You make some money off that, don't you? Yeah, but um, how do you like? What do you do the rest of the year? You know, how what what do you do so that you can disappear for three months off the grid? Because that's the only way I enjoy it. Like when I go there, I don't want to have to answer emails and all that stuff because then I can't enjoy the time while I'm there. So that that was a struggle, and that's what most people struggle with. So they'll, you know, they might guide a hunter to a year, they take vacation from their job, you know, support a family, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, you make money on it, but then, you know, it isn't enough to carry you through the year. So to find something to augment, you know, to make it. So that's where Chris comes in? He's helping you to be efficient enough so that you yeah. can... Yeah, he's taken over a lot of the administrative type stuff. Yeah, and the business has grown enough to where... You know, I'm doing speaking and video production, doing, you know, four or five different things that you're trying to spin plates all the time, and you lose joy when you're you're trying to do too much. You know, it's, it's hard to have joy, you know. And, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Iron sharpens and then iron. How do, you, how do you keep this relationship with your wife and your family? I, I watched the, you coming home. Was that six years ago when yeah. you came home? Yeah, and I'd say just more recently now I've recognized, like, I feel I want to be home with my kids more now. I, I don't know if I didn't recognize it, but I think when they're younger it's more natural for them to want to be with their mom, less with their dad. And now I find myself wanting to spend more time with my daughters. Um, my wife probably tell you she uh, definitely at times she enjoyed it more when I was gone. <laughs> you know, and that was one of the nice things about it, our... our, our uh, um, dynamic is you know she was able to stay home with the kids and knowing that she was there with the kids all the time I, I don't think I could have done it if you know she was working I don't think if she could have done it either you know somebody else watching our kids we decided pretty early on that um, you know that's something we didn't want to give up you know for somebody else to raise our kids and so I mean very very grateful praise the Lord he, he provided for us there was times where it was you know kind of nip and tuck you know we're kind of just getting by which I don't know. I wasn't that bad. I was pretty used to that growing up on a farm. Um, but I always recognized, man, especially early on when I was just guiding, shingling roofs in the off season, did my own constructions. Like if I broke a leg, pulled, you know, herniated a disc in my back or fractured a disc in my back, which all of which happened. But at that time, if those things would have happened, we'd have been, in, you know, didn't have any insurance. So that was always where, kind of in the back of my mind. Where's the disc in your back? Uh, I fractured one about right here and then herniated one right above on my belly button. So I don't know exactly when this happened, but remember I tried dunking a basketball one time and hung on a, on the rim too long and I swung out and I landed on my tailbone and I remember specifically oh. thinking you're going to pay for that when you're older. And then uh, herniated the disc working out and just poor mechanics and muscle imbalances and so yeah, just doing too much too much repetitious movement, shingling work, roofs bent over all the time, just then farming. Yeah, and stuff. I did that working through college. Yeah. Shingle. It's good money, but work, working there's a reason why it's good money. Beer and, well, 250 an hour, that's what we made. So. Yeah. Probably good money if you yes, own the is. business. I never charged enough <laughs> for it to be good money, but it gave me freedom, you know. Yeah, it is good business if you run it yourself. Yeah. Uh, the, other, the other takeaway that I got is rejoice always. I mean, that's one thing that I'm realizing now is when, you know, I, I, I oftentimes said, if you want to, if you want to get into a bar fight or, or want to get, if you're in a fight, it doesn't have to be a bar fight, but if you're in a fight, you need to back yourself in a corner. And I think sometimes God does that. He does back us into a corner to where you've got nothing, nothing else to rely on. And some, you know, not, not, and I mean that not in yourself, but I mean, it's like, holy smokes, how did I get myself in here? And you've got to take it for what it is, you know, and to recognize that if we're seeking our own goals, life around us gets to be a distraction. And that and I don't think that's a way to live. You want to, you know, be thankful that I just heard the bus come home with my kids, you know, and that's easy to take for granted. And yeah, I think uh, that's one of my big takeaways. And the other one is your dad asking forgiveness. I, I, I believe that that would be more important and more impactful to a child than taking him to Disney World. Hmm. To remember, yeah, my dad spanked me. And I mean, like to me, like that just, that's something a child would never forget. When you just say, hey, you know, I've, 
I love you, but I, I admit when, you know, that you admit when you're wrong. And that's, uh, that's not always easy to do. And I was a rascal enough so that it happened more than once. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I talked to Ben about that. He says, well, yeah, I don't remember him ever doing that for me. <laughs> well, I think that was because he was a, a better kid than I was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, yeah, anything we'll we can leave the cameras rolling and anything else you want to add, but man, I uh I really want to thank you for taking time to join us. Um humbling. An Olympic gold medalist. I'm sitting here next to an Olympic gold medal. A wrestler, no less. Um, that's pretty, pretty humbling, John. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, maybe stepping out of your world a little bit. But I think um, our, our paths, our, yeah, our pasts are, are quite similar, and our livelihoods, our lives are very similar. I'd say in many ways. Grew up four miles apart and uh, never met you until. Um, Basically, I just saw a video, and that's when I reached out and I just went, "Man, I got, I got to talk to that guy." Your humility—that's what st stood out to me. You know, when you think of an Olympic gold medalist, uh, your meekness—that's <laughs> that, what it was. Your meekness is like, here's a guy that was a better wrestler at you know whatever your weight class was at that time of the world. There was nobody better than you, and here's a guy that like takes the spotlight. And points it up. That's powerful stuff. And you're uh, you're a light for many, and myself included, and uh, a role model. And uh, yeah, you're you're giving many people something to strive toward. You know, I always tell people, don't. Somebody's like, yeah, I want to be like you when you grow up. It's like. Don't do that. God's got better plans for you than that. Don't try to be me. You just figure out who God wants you to be and you go there. And that's going to be way better than, than anything, you know, you could ever care for. You know, I, when you talk about setting goals is one thing in the hunting world. The big thing is, is everybody wants to see their picture. Um, you know, they want to have their pictures on Facebook or they want to have a mount on the wall or whatever. And uh, like you said, that there's no... Uh, accomplishment in wrestling, you figured that out, I think again we were off camera when you said that, is like there's nothing in wrestling that's going to fill you. There's no gold medal, world championship that's that's not going to fill you. And all these dreams that I had uh, in hunting, that, that's all my dreams revolved around hunting, and they all came true. And that that's why I tell people you need to chase your dreams, and you need to achieve them. And the best thing about it, when you achieve them, you'll realize you'll fall flat on your face. It'll be like letting air out of the tires because it's going to last for a few seconds and then all of a sudden you're going to be like, that's it? That's all That's all there was to it? So yeah, go chase your dreams. Set those goals and see where, because it's, it's going to be an endless cycle. You're never going to reach enough goals until you recognize that your, and sin is something that's not, a lot of churches, I don't find that they really like to talk about it. And, and like you said, that you have a Savior that died for your sin to realize that, to come the fear of the Lord, to recognize that one day I'm going to die. And, and, and if you believe in God, and you got to realize that as humans we have this right and wrong, and animals pretty much don't have that. That's one thing that I recognize. Animals do what they're created to do. They do things not for themselves, but for their environment. That they, they do what they're created to do. 99.9% .9 of the time, yeah, some of the animals, the more intelligent ones, they have a little different personalities and they can be a little bit unpredictable. But by and large, you know what they're going to do as you study them. We're humans, we have free will. And I come to the understanding that that's got to come at a cost. There's, there's a give and take for every action, there's equal and opposite reaction. There's a give and take there. And finally, you know, it sounds like you've watched it, but. When I, when the day Frankie was born and I just was praying to God for the safety of Frankie and, and my wife, I just realized, man, I don't have any right to ask him any favors. And that's when it just, it just hit me to, to recognize that I, I, my best is filthy rags before the creator of all this. And once that Holy Spirit comes and grips hold you, there's nowhere else to go. 
there is there is nothing else and that's kind of the point that I came to through hunting much like uh, you know I've I believe you did through wrestling. I mean, you reached the pinnacle. There's nowhere else to go. And you had a better foundation underneath you long before that uh, than I did. But, yeah, I think uh, a, a similar path to, or, or a similar gift has been handed to us, afforded to us. And praise the Lord for that. So. Yeah, and it's like... Uh... But John Rockefeller, the first millionaire in the United States, I think, he was asked, how much money is enough? And he said, just one more dollar. And that's the way it is, athletically. You win one gold medal, what do you do? You want to pursue another one. It's never it's, enough. No. It's not satisfying. And that's where I, I think God helped me from the beginning, like you were saying. When I won the silver medal, I would. I wasn't terribly disappointed. I was overjoyed that I was a medalist. Did I want to beat Ted Chiavelli? Yeah. After the 76 Olympics, we were uh, competing with Athletes in Action. It was down in Georgia, or I think it was in Chattanooga. There's a big Southern Open tournament that was down there. And uh, some newspaper reporter wrote an article about me. This is one I, I, that I learned that the... Uh, News media don't always write articles the right way. He had written the article and he just came and talked to me and wanted to get a quote from me. And the article that he wrote was basically John Peterson wasn't satisfied with the silver medal. He worked four long hard years to get to, mm. to the Olympic champion. And when he told me about that, uh, he wanted some kind of quote to fit that. I said, no, that wasn't me. Mm. I, I I just went one year at a time, trying to do the best in the world championships in between, and then one, wanting to make the Olympic team. But I had learned how to set goals in a much better way to be shooting at that, and desiring, well, if you're going to be, if you're going to keep wrestling, yeah, you want to wrestle in the biggest tournaments, and the world championships and the Olympics are the biggest ones. So you want to mm -hmm. try to make that team, and then once you make the team, you want to win one match at a time, and who knows what's going to happen, right? That's the way we try to approach our sport in a much better way than just dreaming about that end goal. Perfect. Well, thank you, John. You're welcome. We can do a, this again. A real pleasure. You know, we're only four miles from each other. Yeah, we could probably, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah.